Aloha, everyone, and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, your host and president of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Whether you live in Hawaii or anywhere else in the world, you're aware of the tragic wildfires that have taken place on the island of Maui recently and the devastation of the town of Lahaina. Uh, in our office at the Grassroot Institute, we are still reeling from what has taken place as we have many friends and colleagues who live on the island of Maui, where we do more work than any other island than on Oahu. Please know our hearts go out to all of you on Maui who were affected by this and all who have friends and relatives who have been impacted. We're at a time now where much is taking place. There are plans underway to restore Maui, to rebuild Maui. Uh, that's a big discussion now. There are many stakeholders and voices in that. And at the Grassroot Institute, we are in a posture of listening. Well, we want to hear from those who have Maui and Lahaina in their hearts. And we also want to hear from experts who can offer solutions as we move forward into the future. Rebuilding will definitely not be an easy task, nor can it be completed quickly. The area we know must be cleaned of toxic debris and the community must have the time to go through the human cycle of grief and coming to terms with what has taken place and being a, a part in determining what happens next. There's st steps definitely that state and county lawmakers can take right now to support Maui residents. And one of the important and urgent tasks is to find temporary shelter and prepare for rebuilding efforts. To talk about that, I have a gentleman joining me who spent his youth in Lahaina and is now a permanent resident on the island of Maui. More than that, um, he has been involved in bringing solutions to Hawaii with regard to housing. His name is Ray Michael, Ray Michaels, and he's the president of Maui Plumbing, very knowledgeable about the skilled trades and the building industry. I'd like to welcome him to the show now. Ray, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate that you, you were willing to spend time with us during this difficult uh, crisis. Well, thank you, Dr. Kina. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and talk with you. And, you know, before we begin, I just have to say thank you for all the work that Grassroot Institute has done, bringing accountability and transparency to, to our local government and for all of the uh, learning seminars that you put on, you know, on Maui, on Oahu. I, every time I go, I always learn a lot of new things. So I really appreciate what you guys are doing for our community. Ray, yeah. I don't want to catch you off guard, but I, I do want to, our viewers to know that you're very personally connected to what has happened on Maui, and uh, your family has actually suffered during the, the recent tragedy. Would you mind just sharing a little bit about your background with the, the city, with the town of Lahaina as you grew up, and uh, how perhaps your family was impacted? recently? Sure. Um, so I've been on, Ma I'm 38 years old. I was born in 85. I've been on Maui since 86. <laughs> um, my father originally lived on Oahu prior to then. And uh, so Lahaina is all, uh, you know, spent my youth in, you know, living in the town of Lahaina. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to put into words. You know, one of the things, you know, I tell people is like, I don't think I've ever felt this heartbroken because not only are you seeing the loss, you know, of, you know, our family home and where we grew up um, and my father losing his home. And, but it transcends that. It's our entire community that suffered such a great loss. And my family's been fortunate enough not to suffer any loss of life. Uh, we feel very blessed in that. And, um, you know, my father was able to, to leave behind about an hour before his neighborhood was, was engulfed in flames. And, you know, I feel so thankful he made that right choice. And, you know, but, you know, 
speaking to that, it's it's just affected so many friends and family and loved ones in, in such a tragic way that, you know, because of that, I think, you know, again, this is kind of the most, you know, saddened I, I can remember being in a long time, you know, but I do take solace in how much support, you know, Lahaina has received and how much the community has come together. And, you know, I reconnected with old friends and even made some new ones, you know, during this process. So, you know, I just want to say thank you to, to everybody, you know, on Maui, in Hawaii, and, and even the world and the support that that's been received by Lahaina. I think everybody feels grateful and blessed in that. Thank you, Ray. Our hearts go out to you and your family and as well as to all the residents on the island of Maui who, who suffered in this tra tragic event. Um, as we talk now, though, we want to look toward the future, and you're playing a part in the rebuilding of Maui. You, you've got some ideas as to what the state and the county could do to aid in Maui's recovery efforts. First, um, let's talk a bit about providing housing for Maui residents who've been displaced by the fire. That, that I would think that that would be first and foremost uh, of the concerns, trying to meet that immediate need. What are, what are your ideas here? Um, I'm working with a couple of different organizations. Right now, I'm helping um, the Maui Family Life Center here on Maui. They were being given or donated some continent pods from Hungary that were flown in on C-17s. And these are flat packed um, 20 by 10 uh, containers um, that fold up into a basically a, a livable unit. And you can actually um, add multiple of these together to create larger living spaces. Um, while they don't come with, you know, kitchens and baths, we find that it's going to be very important so that people feel comfortable um, in this facility that we're calling Hope Village, uh, you know, that they have their own private, you know, kitchen and bath facilities. Because what this is really aimed towards is families um, who are displaced with children under five. And then, you know, after those, that group is taken care of, we're going to move to Kapuna. And then after that, it's going to be children, I mean, families with children over five. Um, and what we are working on right now is um, what we call uh, modular uh, kitchen and bath pods that can be added on to these units. So it gives families their own uh, kitchen and bathroom space um, on that unit so that, you know, when, you know, your child it wakes up in the middle of the night and has go to the bathroom they don't have to go to a community bathroom they have their own private bathroom um, that you know people feel safe in so that's what we call our intermediate housing goal right is making sure that we get people out of communal shelters and into their own um, private uh, accommodations you know and you know the hotels have been gracious and i know the government's working with hotels to provide that kind of short-term housing but you know, we know that's, that those funds aren't going to last forever. So it's important that we figure out some intermediate housing uh, goals. And I think Hope Village is going to be a good example of what can be done in a short period of time. Now, now Ray, Governor Green recently announced that prefabricated manufactured homes will play a part in, in the temporary housing. Um, wh what do you know of, of his intentions here? And what is your reaction to his announcement? I'm not completely clear on his intentions, but I really applaud this announcement. You know, the construction industry was going to have to move towards the um, uh, industrialization, we call it, um, or prefabrication of its processes because we have such a deep skilled trades deficit. And this was going to happen out of necessity rather than being by policy. But, you know, it's interesting if you look at places like the UK or Singapore, even Germany, where there's a ton of support for prefabrication. They've been able to mitigate housing crises similar to the one that we're seeing here in Hawaii and in many parts of the country. Uh, and, you know, looking at studies from, from these countries, we've been, they've been able to increase productivity in construction by about 20%. Whereas in the U.S., you know, productivity in construction has remained flat and even decreased in some sectors. And, you know, uh, Dr. Keene, I think it's important here to clarify what we mean by prefab. It, it sometimes has a negative connotation attached to it. and People think of it in, as sort of like generic gentrified buildings. But prefabrication is just one element of what's known as DFMA. And DFMA stands for Design for Manufacture and Assembly. Um, and this is a design-led activity that's 
starts with designers like architects and engineers um, that des involves designing homes for the ease of manufacturing offsite and assembly onsite. And so what DFMA is concerned with is promoting um, standardization and uh, what's called product design, productization of elements in a building, reducing costs, minimizing complexity, um, and leveraging repeatable process. You know, construction is interesting because we're really manufacturing, but we only manufacture the prototype one time. So we don't really take advantage of like economies of scale as uh, manufacturing does. So I'm really, you know, relieved and glad to see that, you know, uh, leaders in government are taking a look at prefabrication and seeing it as a solution to the to our housing problem and to this crisis. Now, what are some of the steps, Ray, that, that you feel the state or county need to take in order to uh, facilitate building and uh, bringing in prefab homes? Uh, there have been some challenges to that. And uh, at this time, we would definitely need to be able to overcome them. I think more encouragement and support to our local industry. You know, what we don't want is, we don't want those jobs leaving uh, our state, right? We don't want to bring in pre prefabricated homes from, you know, um, the mainland or, 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 you know, another country. We want to retain that workforce here. So, you know, countries like Singapore and the UK and Germany that kind of predicted that our construction industry be aging um, and that young people will be reluctant to join the industry, um, created government uh, housing regulatory boards that helped educate their construction industry and encourage the use of DFMA in the construction process by providing studies and the means and methods for prefabricated volumetric construction. You know, we're really going to need to revamp and retool our entire industry in a very short, compressed period of time in terms of the both the means and methods of how we build things and the tools involved to do so. I mean, we're talking about building out factories um, to do things like prefabricated prefab wall panels. Um, so providing grants or tax incentives to companies that utilize DFMA for building efforts would be a big help to jumpstart this transition because it's it's going to be costly for, bis for, the, for the private sector uh, to basically change the way we've been building for the last 50 years. So... You know, any resources government can provide the private sector would be a big help in um, easing the pain of that transition and getting it done faster. You mentioned not wanting to lose jobs uh, to the mainland. And uh, when it comes to actually building and installing prefab work, we need to have a trained workforce. None of it can take place unless there are the workers to put up the houses. Can you tell us, Ray, what's the state of the skilled trades workforce on Maui and in Hawaii in general? Well, I can speak to the skilled trades workforce in general um, and a bit uh, in Hawaii specifically. You know, the construction industry has some of the worst demographics. You know, there's been a lack of vocational training in high school. There's not any universally available and standardized trade programs. Um, and there's been an emphasis, you know, over the last three generation over a college education, over a skilled trade, which compounded the workforce shortage issue we're seeing across all industry as baby boomers move into retirement. You know, looking at Hawaii's demographics from the Department of Labor, 25% of our workforce in construction are baby boomers, and their median age is 68 but the average age for retirement in construction is actually 61. And Forbes did a report about three years ago and found that 40% of the construction workforce is due to retire this decade. And on top of that, there is a group called ACE Mentoring. And ACE Mentoring is architecture, construction, engineering, and they provide mentoring for those entering the field of construction. And they did a study and found that for every seven people retiring in the industry, only one is coming in. And so that's a huge deficit in an industry that has to actually build more homes than ever in a shorter period of time. What are some state laws uh, or changes in our state law that, that could actually help ease the, this shortage we have in terms of, of workers? I, I know that other states do things a little bit differently. For example, uh, recently I learned that North Dakota allows as many as three apprentices 
for a journeyman. Uh, and um, when we look at these kinds of practices elsewhere, well, what could be important to Hawaii and how could we change our law, laws to help it increase the, the supply of workers? Ratio laws are a big one. Um, you know, many trades are subject to ratio laws. And I can speak specifically to plumbers and electricians. We have a one-to-one -one ratio law where we're only allowed one apprentice for every one dirty worker. And it's counterproductive to growing the industry when you have, you know, seven people retiring and only one coming in. We won't be able to keep up with, uh, you know, the retirement uh, acceleration. So changing those laws is going to be necessary. You know, I, I'm conflicted about ratio laws. You know, I, I get the intent, you know, it's to protect, especially with plumbers and electricians, to protect the health of the community. You don't want you know, subpar work being installed. However, you know, that's the contractor's liability. and All our work does get inspected by county inspectors. So I kind of find it a bit of a point to have ratio laws. And, you know, as well, and I can't emphasize enough, you know, vocational training in high school, starting there because, you know, and using those hours earned in those classes towards your apprenticeship. Uh, because most apprentices, in Hawaii, um, before they become licensed, it's a 10,000 hour experience verification. And some of those hours can come from classwork. So if the state could help both waive ratio laws um, or adjust them drastically and help to provide vocational training in high schools that are accredited with the Department of Labor so that those hours that those students spend in that classroom goes towards their apprenticeship. And we can start with just basically a core curriculum, which is what all apprentices start with, no matter what trade you're in. And it's the basics of how to read a tape measure, um, how to cut materials, how to use power tools and hand tools safely, um, why it's important to, you know, wear your protective equipment. Um, and that gives, um, you know, our younger uh, kids a good start in the trade program and will help jumpstart their career in, in the skilled trade. Well, Ray, uh, at the Grassroots Institute, we understand the value of occupational licensing laws, but are also concerned, uh, and our research has shown this, that uh, in Hawaii, they they often interfere with the, the supply of, of workers in, in many fields. Uh, when, it, when it comes to getting a license as a plumber or as a carpenter, how long does it take? So, you know, for beginning and the end, it's five-year program. Now, once you've completed that five-year program, you can apply for a license. Um, you know, I think what would really help is reciprocal licensure. And why is not a true reciprocal state where what they say is for plumbers, for example, you know, Hawaii follows the Uniform Plumbing Code. There are a few different variations of this code, and some states elect to adopt their own version of it that's sometimes more stringent. Um, but Hawaii won't allow for that experience to count unless they've worked under that same code, which I don't really see a good reason for because there's not huge variations in the code that would affect the health of our community. If you had somebody, let's say from Wisconsin, who had three years of experience as an apprentice and moved here, and, you know, those hours should count, but Wisconsin works under the Wisconsin Plumbing Code, which is similar to UPC. But there will be no instance where somebody who worked under a different code comes here, will install subpar work or work that is, you know, not that will affect the health of our community. It simply won't happen. It's it's very minute differences in the code as far as plumbing plumbing goes. And you know, that's why you have inspectors and supervisors to make sure that things are being done through the Uniform Plumbing Code. So I think providing true reciprocity in the terms of experienced work and, you know, under the different types of codes, whether that's the International Plumbing Code that 13 states observe or the Uniform Plumbing Code or each state's uh, individual plumbing code. Um, and that's true for all, for all different skilled trades. And electricians, you know, are another one that have different code variations throughout the U.S., but, you know, none of those variations would have a huge effect on the quality of workmanship, you know, that gets put in.
During this past legislative session, uh, Grassroot joined with many other parties to work on interstate licensure for doctors uh, and uh, bringing Hawaii into the compact that exists for over 40 states. Now that that has been passed into law, uh, we will be able to see an increase in the supply of doctors uh, because uh, of the recognition of mainland licenses. Did you think a similar kind of law or, or um, reciprocal arrangement will increase the supply of plumbers and building in industry tradesmen as, as well as, um, well, well, basically, uh, will, will it increase the supply? Yeah, I think it will definitely help. You know, we're kind of in a weird, uh, you know, rock, between a rock and a hard place, right? We we do need additional skilled craft workers, but we don't have the housing to house them. Um, what we really need is supervisors, people with, you know, over five years experience, 10 years experience that can supervise a crew of apprentices. Um, and those apprentices, you know, come from our local schools. They're our local residents. So if, you know, I feel like it's, we need both. Right. We need licensed reciprocity, but we need vocational training so that we can bring in, you know, people with with good amounts and experience for our, our rebuilding efforts and our housing building efforts that can help train and supervise, you know, our workforce here in the island. Are there any lessons? Uh, I don't know how closely you were following the uh, medical licensure act, but do, are there any lessons we can learn from from that and apply? Uh, to the, the the trades we've been talking about today, you know, I wish I could comment on that. I didn't follow it too closely, but when I heard about it, I'm like, that's exactly what we need for our for our construction workforce. We need we need something very similar. As you mentioned, uh, the economy itself is a huge factor in being able to attract and retain workers here in Hawaii. Uh, they need places to live, of course, themselves. The, the, they need to be able to live off this economy and so forth. Uh, do you think that's a, a, a big part in our not being able to see an, uh, a growing interest in, uh, of young people in, in going into the, the building trades? I'm not, I'm not totally sure. I mean, as far as the economy's concerned, mm -hmm. Maybe you can help rephrase the question a little bit. Well, it's difficult for, for anyone to make a living here in Hawaii today. And housing is one of the, the biggest barriers, uh, being able to afford not only to buy, but even to rent and so forth. So um, a lot of young people and mid-career people have decided to move away from Hawaii. Uh, do you uh, do you encounter this a lot in terms of uh, our supply of people in the building industry? You, absolutely. Um, you know, we've had a number of people who have you know left our company. You know, and this is I'm just speaking personally, but I know other companies experience the same thing. Is this um, people leaving or not being able to make it here does certainly affect the supply of skilled workers. I mean, if you are a licensed plumber, you know, you can make the same money, um, you know, somewhere like, let's say, Las Vegas or Washington or Oregon, where it's still, it's a lot cheaper to live. And so you have a better quality of life. So, you know, certainly that plays into an overall role. And I just think Hawaii's level of personal and economic freedom, you know, really affects people's decisions to, to stay here. You know, I read studies from Cato, the Cato Institute and from the Fraser Institute. We always rank 49th or 50th in terms of economic and personal freedom. You know, you're a skilled craft worker and you can go to a, a state that maybe has less regulation on things. So the cost of living is cheaper. You know, that's a pretty easy decision to make, especially if you're someone from Lahaina whose you know, house just burned down. So you know, Kauai really needs, you know, our government leaders need to take a hard look at that, you know, and what, you know, why is it that, you know, people have such a hard time making it here? And, you know, providing more economic freedom, you know, lowering those barriers to entry um, into the entrepreneurial marketplace, I think is going to be key to retaining our population.
I, I think you've uh, hit the nail on the head. Uh, we, we can't treat the, the shortage of, of workers in, in the building trades and plumbing uh, in particular uh, uh, simply as an isolated problem. It's part of the complex of the entire economy here. And we have to be working for solutions to that as well. And in particular, um, as our governor noted in his emergency housing um, decree re recently, regulation by government really needs to be cut down uh, in order to solve this problem of the shortage we have in, in housing. I, I want to go back to a, a very particular uh, item. There have got to be solutions uh, that that are quick and easy. Well, one I want to ask you about is uh, accessory dwelling units. Could could they play a part in providing the needed housing at this time? Absolutely. I think ADUs play an important role in providing housing to those that were displaced because of the fire. You know, a number of companies and foundations are working on prefabricated ADUs that can be placed. Um, on existing properties where space is available and say, you know, it's uh, you were displaced by the fire and, you know, you have an uncle or a cousin or a friend that has a property and have space on it. So I think people would be much more willing to stay and much more comfortable if they lived in an ADU on, you know, their friend's property or their uncle's or aunt's property rather than, a, you know, a stranger or in a, you know, a shelter village. So it's a solution that I think addresses both the uh, immediate needs for people who have been displaced and also adds to the existing permanent housing stock. So it addresses our long-term housing goals as well. So yeah, ADUs are going to be key to solving this problem. What are some things we would need to do to, to give greater access to the, the building of ADUs? You know, that's, you know, that's complicated. I am working with uh, David Sellers from Hawaii Off-Grid, and he is very Akamai when it comes to, you know, the barriers to, to building more ADUs. I mean, obviously, there's the permitting barrier that we're all very well aware of, um, but, you know, there's regulation barriers. There's building setbacks, um, easements. There's um, uh, the existing buildings are maybe not performing, or maybe they were placed improperly. Um, access to the area. We were going to place a prefabricated ADU. You know, can we get to the backyard? You know, uh, is it accessible? Uh, you know, there's a parking issue. If you, if you add an ADU, you have to make a parking spot available. Um, you know, electrical service to the area. Uh, cesspools are a big one. If you have a property, perhaps you have some room for an ADU, but you're on a cesspool, well, that will need to be upgraded to a septic system. Um, you know. I think the county can help take on um, existing uh, infrastructure upgrades. You know, a lot of the times when you add an ADU, the county's requiring you to do a, uh, a clean out for your sewer line or put in a backflow preventer for your water service or upgrade your water meter or relocate your water meter or relocate where your water line runs because perhaps it's on an easement. Um, a lot of the times there's no accurate asphalt of where the sewer system is or um, Perhaps the water line in the street needs to be upgraded, uh, you know, or the electrical service going to the home is a hun only 100 amps, but really to add an ADU, you need a 200 amp uh, service. So helping with uh, infrastructure upgrades, uh, you know, if the county could do that, that would be a big help. And, you know, as well as permitting, you know, I think that with these ADUs for this particular situation, you know, the industry should be allowed to proceed without a permit so long as the plans are stamped by an architect and it's built by licensed contractors. I think architects are allowed 10 provisional plan review waivers per year, um, you know, for a certain situation. And I think that certainly needs to be increased to, you know, ADUs that are for people that have been displaced by the fire. You know, it shouldn't need to go through plan review so long as, you know, the plans are reviewed, stamped by an architect, and the work is done by licensed contractors. You know, it kind of mitigates the county's liability on that. Sure. So yeah. there's a number of things that can be done. You know, with Ray, the uh, you know, that, that was a very enlightened response. And uh, uh, we're going to have to end there with uh, your suggestion of by right design, which is a very important way of solving the problems that, that you raised. Thank you so much for sharing your 
insight today. Uh, you've got a lot to say that I hope our uh, public officials will listen to. And thanks for your commitment uh, out, out there at Maui to, to the rebuilding. Much aloha. Thank you, Ray, for being with us. Thank you, Dr. Keene. I appreciate being on the show. My guest today, R Ray Michaels, is president of the Maui, Maui Plumbing. And uh, I want to thank him for being on the program and remind you that we do broadcast Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii together every two weeks. And that's when I'll see you again. I'm Kili'i Akina at the Grassroot Institute. On behalf of Think Tech Hawaii, aloha.